Hello and welcome everyone to Objects as Evidence to Answer Essential Questions. My name is Ashley Naranjo and I work at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access in Washington, D.C. I'm joined today by three special guests, uh, Dr. Kathy Swan from the University of Kentucky. She's one of the lead C3 framework uh, writers, as well as Matt Hoffman from the National Museum of American History and Jordan Englert, who is an American history teacher with the Elizabeth Forward School District in Pennsylvania. I'm excited to have all three of them joining us here today. Um, really, you'll hear us talking a little bit about the new Smithsonian Learning Lab, which just officially launched in June of 2016. It's up here on the screen for you at learninglab.si.edu. This is a digital platform which houses over 1.5 million resources from across the Smithsonian's collections. Um, that includes things like digitized artifacts, uh, video interviews with experts, as well as a number of different primary sources that are available to be customized and crafted into different collections for you and your students. There's also tools and different strategies of ways to be able to use these objects in the classroom. You can also adapt what's been created by other teachers or museum educators um, to be able to really personalize what's been created um, for your classroom in particular. So again, that's at learninglab.si.edu. Next, I wanted to give a special thank you to the Grable Foundation for their support of this specific session. This is part of a year-long series, um, in addition to um, a support for a in-person professional development workshop series that we've been uh, collaborating with the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of our guests here, Jordan, actually participated in our last year's iteration of this workshop series. Um, so thank you to the Grable Foundation. I also wanted to mention uh, a warm welcome to those who are uh, joining us from the Connected Educator Month calendar. Um, we added that there because I think this is super applicable to teachers who are interested in trying to think about using digitized objects in the classroom um, and ways to use digital tools to support student learning. Finally, just some housekeeping to ask questions. You should open the YouTube version of this session, um, which is available at http colon slash slash s.si.edu slash objects hangout 1020. So 1020 is the date today. Um, and you can use the chat box either below or to the right of the video player. Um, and you'll see kind of a screenshot of something similar to what you should be seeing um, when you log in. There you can ask questions um, and also interact with our presenters. So if they have made a great point that you want to um, highlight, or if there's something specific that you'd like um, to ask of uh, the presenters, that's the great place to be able to do so. Uh, a quick agenda for the day, what we're gonna do within this 45 minutes, um, we're going to model the question formulation technique. Um, so really thinking about what is it about um, good question asking, um, inquiry-based learning. Um, then we'll also highlight the value of object analysis in the classroom with some examples from the National Museum of American History. And then finally, a classroom example from a teacher who has used the learning lab in his class room and how to inspire curiosity with our students. Last but not least, I just wanted to mention that uh, the conversation certainly does not need to end after today. Um, you can join us on Twitter at Smithsonian Lab. Um, share some of your favorite resources or suggestions or ways that you've used the Smithsonian Learning Lab in the classroom, as well as follow our blog where pretty regularly, almost every week or two, we offer some um, innovative practices that we've seen in the classroom. Um, so again, um, be sure to check out Smithsonian Lab as well as learninglab.si.edu slash news, which is our blog. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kathy Swan. Again, she is the um, University of Kentucky professor in education and prepares uh, teachers in social studies education. Kathy? Uh, hi, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, craft 
attracting curiosity in the classroom and questions and um, and where do questions come from and so I'm going to begin where I begin most talks these days um, is around the C3 framework um, I was the project director and lead writer of this document um, that was born brought into the world in um, September uh, 2013 appropriately Constitution Day um, and so if you don't know already, um, I'll tell you a little bit um, about the document. Um, it's, uh, the backbone of the document is based on an inquiry arc. Um, and so it's sort of a new approach to standards where we wanted to animate uh, the content of social studies with the process of inquiry. And so when we talk about the inquiry arc, we're talking about four dimensions that sort of anchor or um, help to explain what does inquiry, inquiry look like in the social studies. So the first dimension is all about having students um, work to develop and answer what we call compelling questions. Um, we also include supporting questions that help sort of structure the inquiry. Uh, dimension two looks most familiar to social studies teachers. Um, that's where the disciplines reside, civics, economics, geography, and history. You have to do them in alphabetical order or they fight. Um, but within those sections are the concepts and tools um, within the disciplines that we use in order to answer these, these large um, questions um, about the world. Dimension three looks most like uh, the common core where we define the types of evidence, um, the types of sources, and then um, how we use evidence to support claims in response to those larger questions. And then lastly, where the magic happens is in dimension four, where students communicate conclusions in a variety of different ways. And then if we're really uh, on top of things that they have opportunities to take informed action to um, prepare them not just for college and career, but, but for civic life. Um, I had the opportunity the year that the C3 was published to be a fellow um, at the Smithsonian American History Museum. It was one of the best semesters of my life. Um, it was just fantastic um, to, to be um, on site there working with Matt and uh, Naomi and um, Carrie. Um, but one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about is how do the artifacts of the museum really animate um, or how can they be used within the inquiry arc? And so we worked together to develop this sort of diagram um, that shows how artifacts, and I know this webinar is about objects in particular, but how they can be used um, within each of the dimensions. And so when we talk about dimension one, we really talk about objects being used as uh, to, to help kids get curious um, about um, a subject. So does an object help students generate a question? In dimension two, we use objects or artifacts to really build background knowledge. So does the artifact help students understand the topic in some um, sort of way. Dimension three is, is using these artifacts um, as sources of evidence in which they would analyze um, in order to expand or to develop their argument with evidence. And then lastly, do these artifacts help students communicate their conclusions? So for instance, if they're developing a museum exhibit, um, as an answer to a compelling question, I'm, surely they'll use artifacts and objects in order to animate their exhibit. Otherwise, it'll be a pretty boring exhibit. And so what we thought we would do in this um, webinar is focus in on dimension one questioning. I know in my own teaching practice, that's been the thing that I've struggled with the most, um, uh, you know, in terms of incorporating, that we sort of jumped to the answers um, in, instead of lingering in um, the question and, and working on having students develop um, important questions. Um, so, so we thought we'd spend a little time there and I'd introduce um, a strategy that I've been using in my classroom. And, and to, the, to the best of our ability, um, we'll try and simulate um, how we'll use that um, through the chat box. So um, before we get there, I have this great slide. Um, next slide slide that talks about the different kinds of um, historical artifacts that we use in the social studies. And so you all know this. Um, we can use commercials um, as sources of evidence, objects, letters, data, political cartoons, uh, post newspaper articles, photographs, uh, telegraphs, paintings, maps. Um, we are rich 
with sources um, in, in the social studies. And one of the great things that museums um, have done for social studies teachers is to digitize many of these sources. So they're right at our fingertips, which is a fantastic resource that back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was a teacher um, teaching high school students, we just didn't, the internet was just being developed um, by Al Gore and whoever else. And so we didn't really have an opportunity to just have these things at our fingertips. We had to go to our um, to our file cabinets and, and pull things out. So I think one of the really big gifts um, that museums have given us is this access to all of these sources. Um, and sometimes that can be overwhelming too, um, but the access is, is really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the question formulation technique. This technique is um, not mine. I did not create it. Um, it was uh, done by some Harvard um, graduates um, from the uh, Right Question Institute up in, in Boston. And so this is their book. Um, so I'll, I'll give their book some props um, called Make Just One Change, Teaching Students to Ask Their Own Questions. And you can imagine as I was sort of struggling with, I mean, even though I helped write Dimension One, I realized that my own kind of practice around that wasn't very well developed. So I was very hungry to find um, strategies that would help students develop um, really important questions that could help anchor um, small, big, large inquiry. And so I, I stumbled across this and, and it's been a useful technique um, with my own students. So anyway, um, the QFT, um, question formulation te technique has three rules. And so we're gonna sort of walk through those, um, but the one, is that you just produce questions. Um, so that's the biggest rule, is that you respond by uh, using questions. And then we're gonna uh, take those questions and we're gonna improve them. And then lastly, we're gonna prioritize those questions into questions that we might pursue answers to. Um, so we'll linger a little bit in step one and then I'll sort of cooking show the rest of, um, the, of, of step two and step three. So let's get started um, with producing your own questions. This is, this is step one with students. Um, so when we're producing our own questions, um, these are the rules. Um, one is that you just have to ask questions. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and then two is you have to follow the rules, which are ask as many questions as you can and do not stop to answer, judge, or discuss. So often, um, I'll have students in groups of four, maybe even 10. And this is really an important rule because oftentimes we'll stop to edit our thinking um, or they'll stop to edit each other or themselves, not in any kind of um, um, mean or sort of disparaging way, but just because that's sort of the nature, right, um, of what we do. So we're not going to stop. We're, it's going to be easy on a webinar to do that, uh, but we're not going to stop to answer, judge, or discuss. And then when with my students, as I ask for there to be a recorder at the table, and sometimes my students have two recorders and sort of take turns. They write down every question exactly as it was stated. And then um, if you know you say a statement, um, uh, they work to turn that statement into a question. And so usually I have um, notebook paper because they're slow typers, um, and they uh, they write out the questions, and then ultimately they number the questions. So oftentimes I'll have them start out with number one to fifty, so that takes one step away, um, and um, and then just go over the rules. They're fairly straightforward. Okay, so um, once you go over the rules, um, QFT is all about what we call a question focus, a Q focus. And so you have to have, it's basically a prompt, right, to get um, students asking questions. They're not gonna just start asking questions, which would be why are we asking questions or what are we doing right now? You have to give them a focus um, to, to their question asking. And so um, the, the focus that I'm gonna use today is a quote and a historic photograph. Um, the quote is, it is like a book that we are trying to read from the surface to the deepest point. And you can see down below this um, photograph um, of archaeologists digging up bones, um, which always appeals to students, and it's Halloween. 
ish time. So I figured it would be appropriate. So what we're going to do in the chat box is um, I'd like you to just begin asking questions. I'd like you to take a look at this photograph and, and just begin getting curious. It may take a couple minutes. You might have to give yourself 10 or 15 seconds to transition from what I'm sure was a crazy day. Um, but we're just going to give you a little bit of time to just not censor yourself and, and just begin to answer questions. And I'll to the uh, Ashley, I think, is going to read out those questions as they start to arrive in the chat box. So I'm going to stop talking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're hearing from some folks that there is a little bit of a lag too. So um, what might be helpful too is for Jordan, Matt, and myself to kind of get in and put on the hat of students as well um, as Kathy, you're kind of facilitating. So I think it's a good model for teachers to be able to see um, what that looks like. Um, so like you said, um, with the question focus of it's like a book that we're trying to read from the surface to the deepest point. And then we have this image of the archaeologists removing human bones, um, including 10 skulls. Um, so maybe Jordan, uh, myself, and Matt can kind of jump in. Um, one of Jordan's questions that he's asking is, did they find these underground? Great. Also thinking of what types of skills these archaeologists might need. Whose bones are these? Where, well, I guess behind the slide, it kind of says where it is, but even where it is location wise is good. Are these animal bones good? There's a lot of different kind of angles we could take with this. What types of tools are they using? So thinking about the archaeologists and the types of training and tools um, that they might need to be able to accomplish this and their work. How many bones are there? Yeah, absolutely. Why are there so many bones? That's a good question, too. Again, it's kind of fun to not censor yourself as you're starting to think about um, all the questions and possibilities, too. So um, as we start to think about both the bones, the experts that we see in the image, what they're using, perhaps how long ago this was as well, um, to, to understand both the, the time of the photograph, but also how long ago um, and how old these bones actually are. Who do they belong to? Where were these people? Do they form one single skeleton or multiple skeletons? And again, these are questions from um, all four of the presenters as well as some of my colleagues. They're not just mine. Um, I, I can't take full credit for them. <laughs> um, and are these bones from a human sacrifice? Sure. So um, really trying to think about the context of what's going on. Great. So I'll jump in. We're going to cooking show. Um, what are the goals of those digging? Perfect. Um, so um, I like cooking shows. You come back from commercial and there's like a souffle. So um, <laughs> imagine giving your students, and sometimes you have to sort of read your students. I did this the other week, um, not with this particular Q focus. Um, but, um, you know, I gave them about five minutes and then there was like a little lull. And I was going to cut it off, and then they went another 10, um, just asking questions. And so you sort of have to read your students um, and see kind of what their, their cutoff point is. But at, at some point, you'll cut off the questions. And um, at that point, you're going to have students um, begin thinking about those questions, or what we call step two, improving those questions. So once they have all their questions, they're numbered. Um, then you're going to have students um, uh, uh, categorize the questions. And so what the QFT asks you to do, or asks students to do, is to label those questions, to go over each question and, and label it either as a closed question or an open question. So a closed question um, can be answered with a yes or no. Um, an open question requires a longer explanation. And so they would go through their list and mark it C 
or O. Now, I, I sometimes modify this because I'm a C3 girl. Um, and in the C3, we talk about two kinds of questions, compelling and supporting questions. So sometimes I would have students um, mark them not open closed, but compelling supporting, um, just because that's how I roll. Um, but according to QFT, um, they use um, closed or open. And so once they do that, um, then I would have a discussion with students, um, particularly if this was their first kind of time um, to do this. Um, and, and I would ask them, what are the advantages and disadvantages um, of a closed-ended question? And they might say, you know, things like, well, a closed-ended question um, it usually has a, a definitive answer, and there's something satisfying in that. Um, it can be done quickly, um, typically, um, and uh, but um, it isn't really a rich question, one of the disadvantages is it isn't necessarily a rich question for further explore, exploration, right? It's um, by its very nature closed. And so then we'd move to an open question. Well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of an open question? Well, the advantages are is that it's they tend to be more provocative. They tend to be more inquiry worthy in the sense that they're not just one word answers. Um, but probably they have multiple perspectives on those questions. The disadvantage is they take a little bit longer to answer, maybe. Um, so in any case, I would have students really think about um, why do we use these two types of questions? Why would we categorize them? And, and what would be the advantages and disadvantages of each? Then um, I would have students play. Um, a bit and take one of their closed-ended questions and try and make it an open-ended question and and the same take an open-ended question and try and make it a closed-ended question and I think this is more about manipulating questions than it really is improving questions but I think just getting students to linger in questions I can tell you I taught for a long time and um, never did this in my classroom and I'm finding that students that the, the role of the question is, is really um, seminal, um, it, not just in inquiry, but in, in just being a curious person. Okay, so once students would do that, um, I'd have them prioritize their questions. So in groups, they have this list of maybe 30, 40, if you're really lucky, 50 questions. Um, and I would have them prioritize them. So they review the questions as a group and then choose the three questions they consider the most significant or the most important. Um, and then we'd share those questions out, and maybe um, you know, put them around the room. Um, at this point, if we were all in a room together, and, and um, I would ask you a, a few questions, which is, um, and I would ask students this as well, why did you choose these as the most important? Um, and, and have them sort of rationalize um, what makes a good question or a priority question. And then um, where were your priority questions in your entire sequence of, of questions? Did they appear at the beginning? Um, did they appear at the end? Were they in the middle? Um, and have them talk about sort of um, that process. Sometimes the questions come right out at the very beginning. And then sometimes it takes, um, you know, the sort of collaboration of a group to move you to um, these priority questions at the end. I guess a question that I would have this group, and I'm 22 seconds over, so I'll start um, winding down for my colleagues, but um, one thing that I would ask this group is that how might you use this QFT technique with some of the American history um, collections, um, the collections of the, mu the museum, particularly around objects in terms of um, generating curiosity? Um, what might you do? And then the other question that I would ask, um, is what might you do with these questions? So one of the things that I'm, uh, I really love about the QFT is it, it gets students thinking in terms of questions. One of the things I would hate to see is those questions being buried like those skulls, right? <laughs> and so how do we honor the questions so that students don't feel like, oh, well, that was fun, intellectual exercise, too bad that those questions were not going to even pursue them. So I would spend some time thinking about how could you honor those questions given what I know is, is really some time constraints in classrooms. Um, so with that um, technique, I will just end with my favorite quote um, about inquiry. You can't be an ed school professor and not quote John Dewey. It's part of our constitution. Um, but I love this quote. And it, it reminds me 
Um, it's, it reads, only by wrestling with the conditions of the problem at first hand, seeking and finding his own way out, does he think. And so often I get knotted up um, around what is inquiry, um, what is a particular technique. And ultimately, what I think we're really going for is students wrestling with the problem. Um, and I, I go back to that as sort of my mantra around the C3. And what I think about students questioning is that they're really wrestling with some sort of problem or trying to discover um, something. So I'll end there, and I hope that that was useful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kathy, uh, for helping us think through how to um, think about questions with our students and then what to do with those questions. I love that you mentioned to, to honor the students' questions, too, and think about what happens once we've asked all these really great questions. Where do those questions go and how do they get answered? So I really appreciate that. Um, also, we have Matthew Hoffman here. He is from the National Museum of American History. He's created a great learning Learning Lab collection, which we'll add into the chat box as well, um, to, but to support this specific session. And he's looked at three specific objects. Um, and so without further ado, I'll let Matt take it from here um, in introducing those objects. Great. Thanks, Ashley. So we just heard from Dr. Swan about how we can go about creating some uh, great compelling questions. Uh, and I want to give some examples of how we can use objects as evidence to answer some of those questions. Uh, and here at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, obviously, objects are our uh, bread and butter. And whether you're a student or well beyond graduation, when presented with an object, you have uh, you have questions. Uh, you want to know what it is, where it, you know, where it's from, who made it, who used it, why is it important, and so forth. Objects show that history is more than just an abstract series of events. Uh, they occasion curiosity in us to explore in a way that ideas or language does not, uh, and that makes them a powerful teaching tool. Uh, objects can be used to begin conversations about larger ideas and issues in history uh, and make them tangible. Objects can also be used as evidence in answers to specific historical inquiries, and I have a, a couple of examples here. Uh, we probably won't be able to get through all of them, but I made a learning lab collection uh, that hopefully you'll get that link uh, in a second, uh, but Darren should be pulling up. Uh, so that you can access them anytime. Uh, the first object is uh, Abraham Lincoln's pocket watch, uh, which we have in the collection. And a couple of years ago, our, one of our curators got an interesting call uh, from a man who said he had a special knowledge of this watch. He said his great-great-grandfather, a man named Jonathan Dillon, was working on this watch in a watch shop uh, when the watch shop's owner came up uh, and made a news announcement. And this was on April 13th, 1861. Uh, and this According to the story in his family, this inspired uh, Jonathan Dillon to make an inscription on the inside of this watch. So my question to you all is, you know, what might have happened on April 13th, 1861 that wouldn't, you know, embolden a normal watchmaker to graffiti, essentially, the inside of Abraham Lincoln's watch? And of course, news doesn't travel as fast then as it does now, so this may have been a day before. What do you guys think? Any of the presenters have a guess for right around April 13th, 1861? April 13th, 1861, hmm, uh, let's think. Martin, any thoughts? Uh, sorry, I was getting my, uh, I was turning my, my mic on. Um, I got a feeling that somebody surrendered uh, <laughs> on April 13th, 1861. I think it was, um, Am I supposed to give you the answer? I don't know. No, it's okay. Uh, okay. It, it's, uh, it's the firing of Fort Sumter, actually. Yeah. 1861. And you know, even our most uh, experienced curators, and I definitely don't know all the uh, <laughs> you know, dates and times of history. Um, but it, it, yeah, so it was the firing of, of Fort Sumter. And, you know, that was an interesting story. So uh, if we'll go to image three, uh, we decided to check out uh, if this story was true. Uh, if Jonathan Dillon really did make an inscription on the inside of this watch. And we discovered that it was. Uh, and the next slide is a video that we don't have time to watch, but uh, it, it tells the story. Uh, but what we can do right now is take a look at this inscription. Um, so the, the inscription, well, I guess before I even get into it, one interesting question uh, that I thought we could get at with an object like this uh, was, what was the nature of loyalty 
during the Civil War. And there are many different directions you could go with this question and a lot of different ways to answer it. But uh, let's check out the text that is inscribed on, th on the inside of this watch and, and do some analysis. So it says, Jonathan Dillon, April 13th, 1861, Fort Sumter was attacked by the rebels on the above date. Uh, J. Dillon, April 13th, 1861, he put his name again for good measure, uh, Washington, Washington, thank God we have a government. So as a result of this discovery, this watch took on, you know, some new layers of historical meaning. Of course, just a, a normal man looking to leave his story for, story for posterity. Uh, but one of the reasons we love history uh, is that it's a process of lifelong learning. If you're trying to answer questions, uh, you know, for instance, what is the nature of loyalty during the Civil War? You you know, come to some findings, but as you go along, more questions come up. So you'll also notice that there are some other inscriptions on the inside of this watch uh, that Jonathan Dillon's great-great-grandson did not know about and was not really part of their uh, family story. And that is, uh, it says, L.E. Groff's uh, September 1864, Washington, or just says uh, Wash, D.C. And then right in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, you can see it says Jeff Davis. And that seemed, you know, <laughs> a, a little startling uh, to to our, you know, everyone at the museum who's there when uh, this watch was uh, the inscription was unveiled, and and even Abraham Lincoln wouldn't have known about this uh, this message he carried around in his pocket. But when you think about it, uh, you know, you can come to some interesting conclusions that get to this answer. Of course, uh, compelling questions don't have simple answers, and you know, while there literally is a secret inscription on the inside of this watch, it's, it's not, you know, our straightforward answer. We need to uh, think about it, and it can give us some insight and, and evidence into the complexity of loyalty during the Civil War for people in the, the border states or, or Washington, D.C., uh, which, of course, was the capital for all the states prior to uh, secession. So you see we have uh, two different people from Washington, D.C., at least, who made an inscription on the inside of this watch, and, and possibly three. Uh, one is saying, you know, Fort Sumter was attacked, you know, thank God we have a, a government. And the, another is inscribing, probably in the same location, Jeff Davis, uh, who, of course, was the president of the Confederacy, although Lincoln would never recognize him as such. So we have two very different viewpoints uh, represented in the same location, Washington, uh, D.C. And, you know, it really speaks to how, you know, the decisions that someone needed to go through to uh, decide where their loyalty lies had many different layers to it. You know, one, of course, of where they live, but that wasn't the only one. But just because you lived in the South didn't necessarily mean you're pro-Confederacy. Just because you live in the North didn't mean you're necessarily pro-Union. Uh, uh, it, it was a very difficult decision. And, of course, everyone was impacted by the Civil War uh, in the United States, regardless of location. And another important question to ask about the Civil War is what toll did it have on the United States and its people? Again, a difficult question, and one that I think uh, another set of objects that we have here at the museum, the Abraham Lincoln life masks uh, from the collection, begin to answer. So if we can pull up, we have uh, 3D models of these masks. If we can pull up, the, I took a screenshot of them, uh, and there's a link to them in the uh, in the little text uh, with the object, the, the one right below it, actually, yeah, right there. Uh, we don't need to click on that right now. Um, but let's take a look at these objects. So what are some things that you notice about these two life masks? I'll jump in and, and just say the appearance um, from, you know, the left to the right, he looks very gaunt um, in the second picture. Um, and somewhat aged, I would guess, um, based on wrinkles. And um, there's the beard as well, um, which kind of, you know, automatically I, I started to compare the two um, from well-shaven and, and somewhat youthful and nice skin um, to kind of this more, um, you know, uh, gaunt and tired and probably, um, you know, uh, uh, experienced uh, old man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know that's that's exactly you know the same the same observations that, that I have, and I think a lot of people do when they're looking at these two masks. And uh, the one on the left was uh, created by Leonard Volk in 1860, before uh, Abraham Lincoln was even nominated to, uh, for the presidency, and the other one in 1865 by Clark Mills, uh, two months before his assassination. And 
there's this wonderful quote by John Hayes, who was uh, one of Lincoln's uh, White House secretaries. And it sa he says, as, uh, this was written by John Hayes, as time wore on and the war held its terrible course, upon uh, no one of all those who lived through it was its effect more apparent than upon the president. He bore the sorrows of the nation in his own heart. This change is shown with startling distinctness by two life masks. And th that quote goes on to describe in even more detail. And you can find those uh, in the tour that goes along with Clark Mill's Life Mask on the 3D website. You can find by that link. Um, but I think an, an examination of, of these masks, as John Hayes did, uh, really gets at the, the heart of this uh, issue of you know, the, the tragedy uh, of the Civil War and uh, the cost that it had on this country and, and helps answer as part of evidence uh, this question of what toll uh, did the Civil War have on the United States and its people. And uh, I have some more examples here. There was, uh, I was also going to show the cotton bowl here, uh, which is a, you know, a great example of an object that's readily accessible. Uh, we get these from thecottonman.com pretty inexpensively. You can get them, you can, I uh, hope, you know, find them in other areas uh, pretty inexpensively as well. Uh, and we have some resources there on how you can use the, the Cotton Bowl to answer you know, questions uh, such as, does invention always lead to progress? Or how did the Industrial Revolution change the lives of Americans and lead towards uh, regional tensions? Uh, there's also a milk pot on there that has, is an interesting example uh, of evidence uh, that relates to the, the Boston Tea Party uh, the, and the Stamp Act. Um, so that's about all of my uh, time. Um, but I hope these examples give you uh, some insight into how you can use objects as evidence to answer uh, specific inquiries. Uh, and also in the collection, I, I listed a couple of resources. Uh, one is an article about teaching with objects, uh, which may be useful if you want to go down this road. Uh, the other is a link to uh, a MOOC, uh, Teaching Historical Inquiry with Objects, uh, which was done by uh, Dr. Swan and uh, my colleague uh, Naomi Kokion. Uh, and I think they're both excellent uh, resources uh, to look at to learn more about using objects, uh, and uh, I hope that you check those out. And of course, Learning Lab is a you know wonderful example. The Smithsonian has millions of uh, objects that can be used uh, to answer questions uh, and be used as evidence to answer essential questions. Um, and you can, I think, the Learning Lab is the the best place to be able to find those, and uh, and also a place where not only where you can find them, but you can also build. Uh, with lesson materials around them to give them to your students. Absolutely. So someone could actually go to the learning lab.si.edu um, today, take a peek at your collection, and then say, you know, I really wanted to focus in on the pocket watch. And um, they could adapt what you've created, build upon it, um, change reading levels for their students, um, and offer some different kind of perspectives. Um, so they can build upon what you've created, what other teachers have created, or they can create just from scratch. Um, I love some of the other examples, too. It's hard to believe that those two life masks um, are only five years apart um, to think about how much the presidency and the war really changed Lincoln's physical appearance. Um, I can only imagine how it changed him in other ways as well. So um, really appreciate the, the Learning Lab collection you've shared with us, Matt, and some of just the, the sm a small percentage of the large amount of resources and primary sources that are available for teachers and students to be able to explore from the National Museum of American History. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also wanted to spend some time chatting with Jordan Englert. He is an American history teacher in the Elizabeth Forward School District um, over in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. We've been working very closely over the past school year, and I'm glad to hear that him and his colleagues um, have been using the Learning Lab in a number of different ways, including 3D models um, in their classrooms. So without further ado, I'd also like to uh, introduce Jordan, um, and he'll be sharing a collection that he included with his students students um, this past school year. Jordan? Thank you, Ashley. Uh, kind of tough to follow up those two presentations. Uh, I kind of feel like a, a rock star doing this right now. But uh, hi, my name is Jordan Englert. Uh, I'm from Elizabeth Ford Middle School, like Ashley said. Uh, I teach eighth grade um, with my cohort, Stephen Hartnett. Um, Steve and I, we worked on these things together, and we were able to come up with um, some ideas as to what would work well in the classroom. And we had a unit involving George Washington coming up. We just finished the French and Indian War. 
Um, we kind of wanted to discuss a little bit more about George Washington because he's a very large part of our curriculum. And I thought of, okay, well, let's, let's look on the Smithsonian Learning Lab and see what kind of uh, resources there are. And I started searching and I found this really interesting um, statue image um, from, I believe, Gr uh, Greenoff. Um, his statue, I looked at him like, wow, this is kind of um, some pretty interesting. So I'm looking at it and trying to look and try to find some similarities to um, to Greek gods. I mean, that's essentially what his the statue was. You know, it was it was created to make him into almost like a, a mythical being, and that's why I titled my collection was George Washington, a mythical being. Um, I went through, found some more resources in the Smithsonian Learning Lab, and was able to uh, utilize this and create a collection actually really easily. Um, but the main reason why I created this was to kind of spark my students' um, inquiry and try to find out what they knew about George Washington beforehand. Um, I also wanted them to dive in a little bit further into what these images actually, what actually is contained within these images. Um, so what I did was I projected my collection onto my screen up front of uh, my classroom. And it was kind of difficult. If you guys go into my collection, I don't have much on there because I'm trying to. I was trying to make it as uh, anonymous as possible, at least for the first couple slides. Um, but I wanted them to try to find out and, and identify the small, intricate details within this resource. And it, it's amazing what the kids pick out. Um, I had all 25, 30 kids in my in my class um, picking up on the smallest things. You know, from the sword to this, he's wearing sandals um, to that he's he's really really buff. Um, you know, it's kind of funny what you get from what eighth grade students were going to say. Um, you know, they noticed the lion um, on on the throne, um, and and it just kind of getting that that an inquiry type learning. Um, they're trying to figure out, okay, who is this guy? Um, you, when you look at it, it kind of looks like him, but it also at the same time looks a lot like someone who may have ascended from the heavens. I don't really, I really couldn't tell you, but. Um, they pointed out that he was pointing towards the sky, uh, and I thought we found out, you know, eventually this deals with more his ascension. You know, they talk about his ascension as a as a soldier, as a wash or as an American soldier. Um, but it was really interesting to see what the kids really knew about it. And um, we did this. I did this more as a discussion type uh, activity, uh, feeding off of the questions from each other. They started noticing more things, um, and I think you'll see more in the next slide. Um, there's a lot of um, intricate details within this this image. So this is uh, the apotheosis that is located in, uh, I believe, the the ceiling of Congress Capitol Hall, Capitol Hill. I'm sorry. And they're able to. My, my students, I said, okay, what do you see? And they started pointing out. Well, I see a lady with a with a shield. I see I see a Spartan. Um, I, when I zoomed in, I try to stay away from the guy in the middle as much as possible because it kind of it's kind of a dead giveaway when you see a man with blue and gold on and his white powdered wig, but you know, going around, checking out uh, the, the images of possibly angels. Um, you know, they've seen the eagle. They see the stars around the circle, um, the white flags, a lot of women involved, some horses. Um, and, and it was really interesting to see what, what they came up with. You know, what sometimes I see something and a lot of times you'll see something different. Um, and that was really what I was looking for within this collection. Um, kind of like that see, think, wonder type deal. Uh, a picture of, I think, Zeus with a trident. I'm not quite sure. Um, but Can that's... Can you talk about See, Think, Wonder, Jordan? Could mm -hmm. you, for those people who may not know what that means, could you just elaborate just a little bit on how you use that strategy? Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my colleague, Steve, he, he went to a training at Harvard last summer, two summers ago. And he was, it's called the Zero, Zero Project or Zero... Project Zero from That's it. From yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, Project Zero Learning. And he brought this activity back to us, and you know, he was showing me how to how to do these certain things. And um, basically, you you give them a small chunk of the of the resource of the artifact, the object, whatever it might be, and you have them try to start identifying certain things. Um, what what Steve did was his. He took uh, an image of Benjamin Franklin, and he cropped out to a very small. Um, I think it was his glasses, and asked the students, "Okay, what do you see? Like, what what what's going on?" Um, he got, made the image a little bit larger and was able to ask the students, okay, what, what are you thinking now? Like, what do you think this might be? And then they also created the last question, you know, what do you wonder about this image? What do you think is going on in this image? Um, it, it's, it's not difficult to find the resources. Um, it's not difficult to do the activities either because the students really are, they want to give you answers that nobody else has. 
Um, they want to find things that um, that the person next to them doesn't also see, and they really enjoy giving that those EF answers and you know providing the feedback for the class. And that's kind of how you drive, or how I drove my uh, my lesson for that day for the activity. Um, as you guys see, as as we progress here through the collection, it gets more and more um, more detailed to obviously George Washington. Um, you know, we talked about you know why would he be why would this statue be under that painting? And, um, you know, it was interesting to see the kind of answers the students got. And, it, and like, you know, like um, what Kathy said, they don't always have to be right. You don't always have to, to judge them and, and give them direct feedback right off the bat. It's always good to discuss it and see, you know, some things that you find. Um, and, yeah, I mean, moving on here, here's another image of George Washington. Um, what else? The, here's, the, here's the statue. That when you first see the, the resource on the first um, first slide of the collection, you see that it's just a statue. You're not sure how big it is. You really can't put into much ref or much reference as to how large it is. Um, so I wanted to show them it being moved from where it was into the where it's at now, which which I believe is the National um, Museum of or Museum of National History. Um, but they were able to see, wow, that thing is pretty big. I didn't I didn't expect that. You know, it again. Getting the the eighth grader out and have them talking, being that having them be engaged um, in a collection or even any kind of activity is um, is what I'm what we're striving for at, at where we're at. So, yeah, no, that sounds wonderful. It sounds mm -hmm. like with the see think wonder strategy, you were really able to have students think about close looking, just looking for details, um, asking questions about what they're seeing in those details yes. without jumping to analysis of what I assume or what I presume about a specific object. So really mm -hmm. getting to use those details of the object as evidence um, in creating really good questions. Um, so it sounds like it was a great activity. Oh, so yeah. this is also a collection that um, Jordan has published that's available on the Learning Lab um, at learninglab.si.edu. You can type in George Washington and go to the Collections tab and it'll be one of the first ones that appears in your search results. Um, if this is something that's of interest, you can also adapt this collection, build upon it, um, add more uh, strategies or questions or take some out, um, add more resources based on what your students are interested in and where you are in your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, with that, I'd love to open um, the conversation up to um, some lasting uh, last questions or thoughts from um, our presenters. Um, I know that we still have a little bit of a lag with the live arc, uh, session, um, so we're getting kind of, um, you know, about four minutes behind of uh, some of our audience members. Um, so there might not be as many questions from the audience, but I would love any last minute thoughts um, from either Kathy or Matt or Jordan. I can go. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to add was um, that we, we actually eventually had the students create their own collections. And by doing that, they were able to, um, to narrow their search more as if they were a researcher. Um, a lot of times it's very easy to go into Google and find images. But once, when you use the lab, you need to um, specifically look for what you're – or find what you're looking for, search what you're looking for, um, which was really cool. Um, as a teacher, I know that it – the first one was kind of difficult to figure out, but after that, it was actually really easy. Um, and we used it a lot more times last year in the classroom than we originally expected. And I plan on making more this year. Um, you know, my school was a one-to-one -one, um, district. So, you know, all my students have the, have an iPad and it does work on the iPads. Um, you know, I'm able to create classes. The students were able to create or to join my classes. Um, I could create assignments and things on there and, you know, link it. To, I couldn't link it directly to my grade book, but, um, it was it was really fun, and it's something that um, we plan on using more and more in the future, for sure. Well, I'll just say um, thank you, Jordan. I'm I'm doing um, PD in Cincinnati tomorrow, and okay. I had to pull some things together um, tonight. And I think you just helped me pull it together. And so I'm going to. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be using some of these George Washington um, uh, sort of uh, uh, memories, uh, I guess, um, remembrances as a way of thinking about how do we remember George Washington. And I saw 